What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like founders of P90X, Atari, now Steve Sims, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, anyone with clients, serving clients one-on-one, shift from one-on-one to working with them one-to-many and not just trading time for dollars. Go to Rise25.com. Check out our and download our free dream product ladder. Helps you design your business on one sheet of paper. I am excited. We have Steve Sims, founder of Bluefish. And I will make a bold statement, Steve. Listening to you expands my thinking in universe because what I love about what you do is every time I listen to what you do for yourself and others, it makes me realize that anything is possible. And uh, Steve started off as a bricklayer, and he's created one of the world's most recognized concierge firms, Bluefish Concierge. And he's the author of Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. It is a must-listen to, a must-read. I will listen to it when it comes out. And as he describes it, it's not a gopher service, not an old boys network. It's not a snobby bunch of party-crashing show-offs. Um, don't call them to pick up your dry cleaning. Instead, they offer the highest level personalized travel entertainment. And there's so much Steve has done. And I know, Steve, you know, you get these questions over and over. Like I was saying, I've listened to nine hours of video. So I'm going to get to the heart of it. And I'm going to just tell people, you've helped people take submarines to see remains of the Titanic, getting sta- on stage and performing a journey, going to Elton John's Oscar party, going to the Grammys. You've had someone married by the Pope at the Vatican, a private dinner in Florence in front of Michelangelo's David with Andre Bocelli, serenade. Anyways, most cherished thing for Steve is his family and friends, and as long as he has enough whiskey and food and motorcycles. So, Steve, thanks for joining me. It's a pleasure. What an intro. I can go now. Yep, that's it. That's it. (laughs) So, tell the story about, first of all, we were talking right before weaknesses, and you scratched the whole first book and getting the rights to the audio. So, what were you saying about weaknesses and your strengths? Um. So the sto- just to give you the, the, the quick story, you know, yeah. I got approached to write a book. People had often said to me, oh, write a book, write a book. And I didn't want to write a book because if I mentioned any clients in it, I'd probably be dead before cocktail hour. <laughs> so then it was Tucker Max that actually came up with the idea and Jason Gaynard of why don't you focus more on how you do things rather than what you do. Yeah. So that all kind of led to me meeting some phenomenal agents over at Folio that introduced me to Simon Schuster, which ended up getting me a beautiful fat retainer, which bought a very nice motorcycle, and I had a book deal. And I thought, job done. Now I just write a book. Can't be that hard. Um, <laughs> so delusional as well as stupid. So I got a ghostwriter, and we, we banged this book out because I'd already got paid. So, you know, in in my company, people pay me before I do something. I've got paid. And quite simply, I fell in the trap of kind of like, well, I've got my money. You know, good, good. I'm I'm very happy. I've got a very healthy retainer on it. Um, And we wrote this book. And I remember reading this book. And I suddenly got overwhelmed. And and they all say this kind of aha moment. I have no kind of I was in a car crash or I lost lost my left testicle to this. I have none of those aha moments. But I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning. And I was panicked and I was panicked. And it's very stupid. I was panicked about Bert. I'd had this dream about this guy, Bert. I don't know anyone called Bert, but I dreamed about this guy called Bert walking through the airport, looking in a bookstore, seeing my book, picking it up and then reading it on the plane on the way home. And I thought, I've just given this guy a lump of garbage. Mm. I've just given him something to help me get my retainer. And that made me feel so I phoned up the morning I woke up in the morning I went this is shit you know I've got to what make was sure bad about hurt. it what didn't you like about it it didn't flow um it didn't flow and it was more kind of hey I did this and then I did this and oh and this was really good it was great story time reading if you had a couple of cocktails and you wanted to sit around a fireplace you'd have probably loved it but what I felt was that this book was to um get you over your excuses, you know, and I've yeah. always said I'm a, I'm a bricklayer and doorman from East London. 
what other excuse have you got? Because people go, oh, he must have had a silver spoon. Oh, he must have had billions. He must have known someone very wealthy. Did I shit? I was working on the door of a brothel in Hong Kong. And now I run the world's greatest concierge, phoning up some of the biggest people in the planet. And, yeah. and you know that. Yeah. Um, so there are no excuses that you can go toe to toe with me on. And that kind of got me very passionate and energetic that I didn't want to give you a cocktail story. Yeah. I wanted to give you a hack. Yeah. You had to realize to of like a theme. Like this was a, yeah. a bigger message that you wanted to get out there. And that's where it started coming yeah. down to. It yeah. started coming down to a lot of people are frightened of big. Everyone says, oh, look at the big picture. The big picture scares a lot of people. So yeah. if I said to you, hey, I want you to get someone married in the Vatican. You go, oh, you can't do that. Well, at the end of the day, it's only a church. It's only a public location. So if you break it down to what it actually is, really isn't that terrifying. It's about as terrifying as getting the city hall to agree. Yeah. So the steps are exactly the same. So we rewrote a book based on the art of making things happen, how we actually do something. Right. And yes, we did this with Andrea Bocelli. Yes, we did this with Sir Elton John. But you can do this for a kiddie's birthday party or opening up a florist or marketing a new widget. So yeah. that's why we rewrote the second book, canned the first one. So this is actually our second book, but the first one that will ever see the light of day. <laughs> you know, I would love the first one to be a bonus of the second one. So <laughs> I just want you to consider that. Anyone who gets that, maybe yeah. they should get the bonus one, the first one as a bonus. And let, maybe, let them be maybe, the judge. Yeah. Maybe so that's just think a, about that. Maybe that's something. Yeah. Because okay. yeah, that has me intrigued. I want to. I want to. The first one. It's kind of like you know Star Wars. You start with like the, the third or whatever, the, the the later one, and you come <laughs> back. So, what? Um, you thought there was an interesting story about the audio rights. So working with Simon Schuster, they contacted me one day and they said, "Look, we've we've got an offer to do the audio book." And I said, "Oh, that's fantastic!" And they said, "Yes, um, we've got people to interview for it and to read uh, a part of a chapter." We've had, and I don't know how many people they had, like about nine or ten people. We've selected these three as our favorite. This is the email I got. And there were three um, voice memo things. Number one, number three, and number seven. And I listened to these, and these came through my agent. So Simon Schuster had sent them to my agent. My agent had sent them to me. And I listened to these three Americans trying to put on a British accent. <laughs> they weren't, so, it was an authentic British, British accent. No, oh. no, it's the only audio book with subtitles. So I actually went back to him and I said, uh, I've got an old English bulldog and his left testicle sounds better than any of these. <laughs> However, if I had to choose, I'd choose number seven. And I sent that back to my agent. My agent, in all of his skills, sends it direct to Simon Schuster, who come back and said, well, if, you're, if your dog's left testicle is not available, <laughs> would you be willing to audition? Yeah. And so I actually auditioned for the book. Um, they make you I audition for your own book. They actually made me read a chapter to see if anyone could understand what the hell I was saying. <laughs> um, so I auditioned and uh, I, <laughs> whoa, I got the book. <laughs> so uh, good for you. I, I got locked in a porta potty for about two days, which uh, no light, no fresh air. And it was just, just horrible. It sounded a lot more exciting when I got the deal than when I actually did it. So it's coming out. You will have an audible version of yeah, Blue it's Fishing. done. Okay. Um, I'm unsure when this gets released, but uh, yeah. it's it's out very shortly. If not, cool. if not out already. All right, I'm getting it. Um, I want to talk about no excuses. I, you know, this is about mindset, and no excuses. Um, and from a bricklayer, so I want you to talk about your kids. Right, you grew up. And you were bricklaying, your family bricklaying. It was backbreaking work. You hated it, right? And you say in the book, I'm going to hate my teen self for saying this, but it's one of the best things that happened to you. How mm -hmm. do you instill that, that bricklaying mentality in your kids? Because I know you have three kids. Tell me about yeah, I do. I, I'd love to hear about how you're raising them and what you're doing with them. There is no harder job than parenting. Yeah. And any parent out there knows that. Yeah. And we all get it wrong and then the kids grow up and they get kids and they go, well, I'm going to do things differently and they get it wrong. And right. it, it's a constant, there is no book that tells you how to do it. Yeah. Um, and by the age of 13 years old with, with, and even younger with YouTube and everything like that, that's seeing more of, 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 you know, little Wayne than they are of you. 
So, you know, you're always competing against new things. <laughs> could be a scary um, thing. Yeah, yeah it, it is scary as hell. I'm hearing people that this my boy talks about, he's 11. I don't even know who they are. They are, but he's downloaded and subscribed to them. So there's a lot of bu- uh, elements to get in the way and hurdles yeah. to get in the way. Um, as you fell over a lot, I'm talking about me and most parents, yeah. we tried to avoid our kids going through that same pain. Yeah. What I did actually realize was it's the pain that makes me realize how strong I actually am or right. what I can handle. Right. You get a punch in the head and you don't die and you go, all right, I can get a punch in the head. Right. You, get, you get more stuck in. But you yeah. see so many people very scared of things that the scare becomes the scare itself. Um, so with me, my kids want their pocket money. Great. You've got to hoover out the car. You know, you, you want to go to the, you want to go down the pub and you want some extra cash for the, for the gas tank. Absolutely. I've got a bike that has been on the track, detail it and clean it, you know? So I'm very, and you have your arguments with your kids, but you've got to, in your heart, know that you're doing it for that benefit. But I, I really do actually, I, I did a, um, I'm doing a, a party, as you know, for the launch of the book in, uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, my boy's 11, and he reckons he's a bit of a whiz at Photoshop. So I said to him, fine, within 24 hours, I want three invites designed. Um, and he designed three invites on Photoshop um, for, for the invite. Yeah. Um, I'm going to use one of them. And I, I paid him for the one I used. I didn't pay him for the effort. I paid him for the product. Yeah. And that's a, I try to teach people, people that lesson that you're paid to actually do something, not think about it or plan it. So, yeah. Yeah. Cause I love the, it's a mindset. It's no excuses. And also, so you've been with your wife for, since you were six, you met her when you were 16, right? Yeah. I was how, 17. She was 16. How would you say, how would she say you've changed? Like you still say like, I'm simple. I just, like whiskey, food, motorcycles. How would she say you've changed since when you were younger till now? Maybe it's a mindset. I don't know. What would she say? Probably that I'm an incredibly good looking man. <laughs> um, the fact that she's not here, she can't defend that. Um, when I was a young lad, yeah. and you, you, you just kind of like touched on it earlier. When I was a young lad, I used to ride around on a motorcycle uh, south of London, black t-shirt, jeans, enjoying whiskey and beer. Okay. I wanted to get out of that life. What I hadn't realized was that life was more authentic than some of the life that you get outside of it. Everyone's walking around in a suit and their credit cards maxed out so that they've got an expensive watch on trying to Mm. tell you that they've got millions in the bank. There's so many lies when you get in that. You walk in a pub, you annoy someone, they punch you in the head. It's a very, very, very easy (laughs) existence there. Um, Keeps people in check, right? It yeah. does, it does. But there's just people in the world you just don't mess with. Um, and in my kind of life as I was growing up, I learned, can I talk my way out of it? Know when, okay, the talking's over, the action start. I learned all of those things. So now I get into this piranha pit of all of these people trying to can I tell me, oh, I'm this, I'm that, oh, I'm very important. And all of this BS, and especially with social, I've got that great bullshit radar right from the start. Mm. So... As I started to get uh, richer, and I say richer, not wealthy, as I got richer, i.e. bank account money, I tried to change. I physically went, ooh, people have got to take me seriously now. I better get a nice car, better start, start yeah. taking out my earrings. I, better. Yeah. And I, I don't changed. see you ever doing that. That's the funny thing. Yeah, no, I did. And it's a very, that was my aha moment. I actually became someone I wasn't. And it was, uh, it was very upsetting. And it was very scary. And my finances started to go down. The people mm. I used to resonate with, no longer did I resonate with. The people that were in my roller decks had money, but they were a-holes. And I was like, hang on a minute, this is going the wrong way. Yeah. So I ditched it all. And I put my earrings back on and uh, went back to my black t-shirt, riding on bikes. And now I've gone full, full circle. I don't have a car. I have a few more than just one motorcycle now. So I'm very fortunate there. Um, but I've gone back to the man that I was when I started. I'm very transparent. I'm impossible to misunderstand. I'm a great friend. I am your worst enemy. I'm very simple as an individual. There is no onion on the other side of this Skype. Yeah, it's tough. You know, uh, it's kind of like keep up with the Joneses and people feel like they need to impress and you realize that pretty quickly. 
probably because I think I can only find one picture on the internet with you in a suit, and that's it. Uh, but uh, I, I wear a suit every year for Elton John's party oh, because okay. I love getting I, I love getting dressed up in it. It's the only time I get dressed up in my penguin suit, and uh, <laughs> you know we we get to walk down the the, the white car. He has a white carpet, not a red carpet, because he's Elton John, and. Uh, you know, you're walking down the the white carpet and Charlie Sheen's in front of you and Stephen Tyler's behind. It's just one of those times you go, oh, this is kind of funny. And uh, I remember, funny enough, because um, they back you up. What you don't get to see on TV is you get to see a couple of people on the red carpet and they're kind of like waving and they're talking. You don't see everyone backed up at the edge of the red carpet and then they go, okay, next three, uh, next four, next three. They, you don't see that bit. And I was behind Stephen Tyler and I said to him something about, Oh, on the white carpet or something like that. Or, you know, something about, oh, you ready for the white carpet? And he turned around and in a very, and I'd met him a few times, been in a very uh, vulnerable statement. He looked at me basically into my soul and he said, you know what? They never see the journey it took Mm. for us to get to this red carpet. Yeah. And then he just turned around. I was like, wasn't expecting that. But, you know, it was uh, it was quite important. I do realize that no one remembers the times that yeah. I was damn near bankrupt, the amount of lawsuits, how I got screwed over, um, how I got beat up. You know, just no one remembers yeah. all of that stuff. They just look on social, see you stood there with Elon Musk at, you know, SpaceX and go, oh, you know, he's lucky. They don't remember what you went through to yeah. get to where you are. 100%. Yeah, I mean, that's the question people ask you, right? How would you get Andre Bocelli? And you're like, well, it was like 20 years of connections and hard work and sending handwritten notes to people and that's how i did it right yeah they don't know that they don't know the journey i'm a great believer in uh, leapfrogs um if i need to get to someone i will find someone else that they respect and someone in my circle and i will get them to introduce me if i come straight if i come straight to you i'm a self-promoter if i get someone that you trust phone you up and go hey jeremy yeah, he's a weird fellow and, uh, you know, he looks like George Clooney, but still <laughs> listen to him regardless. Right. Then they, you will go, oh, okay, no. and I have that. So when I needed Andrea, I'd already been working at the Vatican. I went through the Vatican and people tend to pay attention when you get phoned up by the Vatican. <laughs> but one of your, so there's a mindset piece, but there's also a concept I love what you talk about is the one of the ways you can help people achieve whatever their bucket list items are is you make it a win-win. And... Mm-hmm. The, the Andre Bocelli is an example, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Because you supported him, not just the money piece, but you supported more. Yeah, we had a client. So to, to give you the full aspect, we had a client that gave us the, uh, the challenge of I want the most ex- exclusive restaurant in Florence. And anyone that knows Florence knows that there are no exclusive restaurants. So that's the whole point of Tuscan living. It's, that's the beauty of it. You're in, a, you're in a restaurant one night, you leave, and you've now got 22 extra members of your family. Um, So we had to design one for him. So we had to pick the most iconic place in Florence. We chose the Academia because of Michelangelo's David. We talked them into allowing us to have a dinner in there. Um, And they don't even have food and drink in this place, which is hilarious. We had a dinner there. And then we wanted to see how far we could take it by getting the most iconic singer in Italy uh, to sing. So when we reached out, we knew what we wanted. And it's very easy. When people go forward, they are fully prepared in what they get out of the conversation. You know, masterfully prepared. So what we, all, what we always tell people is when you go to someone, be as prepared as to what they get. Because there's an old, there's an old idea that, you know, you can get your, your foot in the door and you can get in that door. But you want to be in a situation where you are so irresistible they don't want you to leave. Yeah. That's the key. So when we go to someone... We know what we want. We want Andrea Bocelli to play. What's the benefit for him? Nine times out of ten, the cheapest commodity, the most vulgar commodity in the world to approach anyone like this is finances. You phone someone up tomorrow and you go, hey, I'd like to do this. How much? Now, unless you're getting someone to do your lawn or fix your roof or something like that, which is a transaction. But if it's a relationship, Mm. yeah, you want you want. You know, Elon Musk to come and speak at your event, you get through to Elon and go, hello, Mr. Musk, yeah, how much for you to be here on Tuesday? He's going to hang up on you. He's not even going to ask. Um, so you've really got to go into someone saying, hey, bear with me a second, but I want to talk to you about your blah, 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 blah. 
I have a situation in which I feel as I can benefit it. Yeah. Now, with the Andrea Bocelli, they have a foundation. They have a cancer foundation. So we went in there saying, hey, thank you very much for taking my call. But I want to talk about what you've got there mm. because I've got something that I feel could benefit this. Yeah. And so you're going into it for a win. You're getting what you want out of it as long as they get something equal. Yeah. And I think, if memory serves correct, you had like 48 hours, right? Yeah, make that this happen. was crazy. It, I was in Rome on the Sunday. I got asked to do this on the Monday morning. Uh, I was in Rome. It's I not like you had a year Friday. advance. Like try and no. try and do this a year a year from now. Yeah, it was on a Monday, and this was for the Wednesday night. And we got uh, we got Andrea on the Tuesday morning. So uh, we spent all Monday trying to find the location, and then uh, um, that's what we did for uh, that's what we did for the, for the Andrea was on the Tuesday. It was it was a phenomenal event, phenomenal. That's amazing. And you know, a lot of times with entrepreneurs like yourself, you you make it a win win, and it's not just about the bucket list, but it's also about pulling in great philanthropic causes. Because I remember one guy, you, the journey story, right? But he tied that into raising money for autism. Yeah, yeah. You, right? Again, this is all about going to someone that benefits them first. Yeah. Or the perception, let's, let's be blunt, the perception that it benefits them first. So when we had the, uh, the, the gentleman that wanted a single journey, we had to get them on our side. And it was very easy to get, you know, a couple of tickets backstage to meet and greet or, you know, get them in. And it, but to actually do something, we had to get them engaged. Yeah. So we had, to get the, we had to get something that made them go, oh, you've got my attention. So when we were speaking to him, we actually discovered that the drummer's son had autism mm. and was a, uh, a, a great uh, supporter of Autism Speaks. Right. And Dan's brother's son also had autism. You didn't have to be Einstein to connect the dots and go, well, hang on a minute. Let's wrap this around autism, right. carry the flag of autism and everything we do, we yeah. market autism, whether it was the band, the uh, photographer, the, the websites, the emails afterwards the in anything we gave a blast out for autism speaks which yeah. means that we still have that relationship with journey so and i know you have i think of a foundation talk about some of the other philanthropic tie-ins to to what you do <sighs> foundations <clears throat> there are people that work in foundations that are taught to not let anything happen smoothly yeah. and to basically just say no to everything um we went through recessions this uh, this century uh or this decade should i say um where we found a lot of rich people were using foundations to to you know take money out mm. so foundations are heavily uh, heavily uh, looked at um by the government and the red tape around foundations and charities is insane and you always get the 90 year old woman that's only just working out how to do an email the other end of the foundation so what we've done is we've gone out there and we we've spent many years getting involved in a lot of um uh financial projects you know the grammys the kentucky derby the new york fashion week monaco grand prix we also now try to get involved in as many events as possible that uh look after a lot of um lifestyle and disease we try to get involved in cancer foundations we try to get in aids research we try to get involved in amfar leonardo dicaprio's water dot org any of these things that we can get involved in where there is a good reason behind it for them to be getting this money yeah so any close to your heart in particular you know it's always hard it's like picking your favorite child uh, which depends on depends on the day. I right, guess. Exactly. Um, <laughs> that could uh, be an easy question depending on the day. Yeah, that's, an, that's an easy one. Yeah, who is it today? Mm. Um, <laughs> but uh, I am a great supporter of Scott Campbell and Elton John with the AIDS Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, I, I ask myself the question: Why does this disease still exist? Mm. Um, and equally, uh, through personal um, and to a lot of people's personal uh, cancer. Um, these are two. These are two things that I just scratch my head, going, "Why are we sticking people uh, in, on the moon and in space and stuff like that?" Where you know, there's these things here. Yeah. I, I have, I'm not a scientist, but I am. I am a why guy. I'm always like, "Why? Why? Why does this? Why is this still here? Why are we in this century and this still happens?" Yeah. So, 
I, if I if I get someone come to me and they say, hey, we're doing this and it's for cancer, I'm doing this, it's for AIDS, I'm like, all right. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier, you know, this journey is um, to get to the, the white carpet or red carpet. What were some of those big challenges, those setbacks that you had? Besides, being, com yeah. being comfortable in me. Um, have you ever heard of something called ugly baby syndrome? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I actually had this, uh, this, this guy, a uh, big shout out to Jason, if he's listening, who actually came to me once and said, about, you got ugly baby syndrome. And I was like, what the hell is that, you know? Um, but I would hold on to everything. And I felt as an entrepreneur that I had to therefore control and do everything. Um, and quite simply, there was a ton of stuff that I couldn't do. So learning to get out of your own way and learning that delegating is not detaching. Mm -hmm. It's just assigning responsibility. Yeah. Um, you you want to do everything. Is that why? I did do everything. Yeah. You know, I, was, I, was, I would employ someone to do the website and then I'm over their head. I remember when we had a website done, I was over this person's head going, well, I wanted to do this, and then that comes in, and then when you push that button, it goes, and like fireworks go there. And I, I designed my own website, and the guy's like, yes, but we can do that. And we get, yeah, that's great, but it's got to go over there. So I wanted to control it. Yeah. And, and at the end, he brought, I remember this, he brought me down, he went, oh, I'll show you your website now, and he showed me this website. And I was sat there, well, I was stood there watching it over his shoulder, and I, I couldn't see his face, and I'm thinking, this is the ugliest piece of garbage ever but everything does what i've asked it to do and it's the color schemes of one online and then he just went and this is what i think it should look like and then he opened up his page and i was like oh god thank you so much <laughs> and i realized that i need to realize and joe polish talks to you about this if someone can do something you can do at minimum as good as you can do it pay them to do it and as, as dan sullivan says don't focus on your weaknesses. Otherwise, you end up with some really strong weaknesses. <laughs> Just get somebody else to do it. So right. and I, I am now, I've now gone completely the other way of ugly baby syndrome. I get a project in it and I, I detach that project into as many slices as I can. And I go, right, okay, you handle that. The invites that, that goes over there. The page, the logistics, the cars, the catering, blah, 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 blah. Oh, there's the bit that I've got to do. Yeah. Okay, I found that little nugget that no one else in my crew can do. I'm going to do this. Yeah. Talk about that. What's the bit you are best at and you love doing? What is that? Well, that's, that's the two things. Um, God, I hate to say the next word, but I'm quite good at getting people to do what I want them to do. So I'm very good at positioning. Yeah. Um, well, it's that, a win-win, right? You position in a win-win. So it has to be a win-win. Yeah. If you do, if some of, if if I speak to my friends now, and, and that's the other thing, when you build up these relationships, they become friends. I haven't worked in the Vatican for two years. I still communicate with them. Um, so if if you have these relationships and you have these friends, and you go, hey, I need this done, they go, yeah, I'll do you a favor. No, I want no favor from you. Not now. Not ever. I want a whiskey with you. I want to hang with you. I want to go dancing on the cobblestones with you, but I want no favors out of you. So what can I do for you? You know, I had a client the other day. I needed him to do something for me in Miami. He was going up to, um, to New York. I got him uh, some really good tickets for Hamilton. Um, mm. And I just went, we're good. I had another guy that wanted to, do, uh, wanted to meet Britney Spears. Don't know why, but he did. So I arranged that. <laughs> so I don't ask questions. To, don't yeah. ask questions. I never ask questions. So I just wanted to make sure that they are covered to get what they they want so that when I call again, it's not a favor on top of the favor, on top of a favor, you know, the favor's gone, you know? Do you remember I asked you to do this and you got this? I'll give you this. Can I get this? And so it goes that way. And I know you've said, another common question you get is what's on your bucket list? And you're like, you know, there's not much. But I'm curious of, has there been anything in your wife's bucket list? That you've been able to uh, do. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. All right, so she's just left. <laughs> I will make sure she never sees this. I this, want her to see this. I'm sending this no, to her. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so years ago, 
years ago, I realized that I hate Hallmark. I hate Hallmark because they make money out of me buying some chintzy little card to give you on your birthday. So we I, I'm in complete 100% agreement. Yeah, 100%, yeah, yes, I, yeah. I, I'm not there to keep Hallmark in business. Yeah. So what I started doing was I started celebrating Happy Tuesday okay. and Freaky Friday. So randomly, she'll get like some flowers and I'll book a meal and I'll be like, it's Freaky Friday. Did you miss it? You know, did you not know? And so it's a standing joke. But on her birthday uh, and Christmas, she gets nothing. <laughs> no card, no. Pl- and I and I know everyone's out there going, "Boo, bastard, horrible wanker." Boo. She gets nothing. But what I do is I provide her with an experience, and she is crapping her pants every year because all the way through the years I've sent her skydiving, unarmed combat with Navy SEALs. Um, I sent her shooting with. Um, the head of uh, uh, one of the Navy SEAL teams, I won't tell you who the captain was, but one of the serious ones that went out there and did the business, uh, went out shooting all this machinery. Uh, She's done Formula One driving. Uh, She's met uh, heroes like Sting. Um, But she doesn't, she'll go, oh, that'd be nice. And nowadays she goes, oh, that'd be nice. Don't you do that. And (laughs) suddenly can I realize. So last year, and because... Years ago, we used to do some work with Ferrari. And then when I came here, I did some work with Porsche. And we actually had a Porsche. And that was the car that we fell in love with. As I say, I don't have a car now. And we got kids. So, you know, you end up with the mandatory uh, um, big big trucks. Um, right. She's got an SUV. So last year, I sent her to the Porsche racing experience mm. with a Porsche Le Mans winning driver who basically taught her how to drive and then scared the shit out of her for like a two-hour wow. learn-to-race a Porsche racing car. This year, she's 50. and I can't even imagine. This, this, put it this way, it's not in this country. She <laughs> doesn't even know that. But it's... Um, these are, it's a lot of these are surprises, Steve. Like, are they surprises that she doesn't know, or is a lot of, she knows... She wakes up in the morning, yeah. and she has no idea. And yeah. even now... She's like, I'm 50. She's scared. She said, don't make me run away to England. You know, don't make me, can I disappear so you can't find me? And I'm like, babe, you'll love it. And us, a couple of times, like the skydiving. Yeah, what's the she one she too- hated you the most afterwards? Skydiving and uh, motor racing. Um, she likes cars. She liked the Porsche, mm-hmm. but I put her actually in a race car. And when you're in a race car, you've only got your helmet and you're about that far off of the floor. The uh, sensation of speed is far greater, like on a go-kart. Yeah. Um, and we had guys there really pushing her and she wasn't too happy about that one in the sky. I would have freaked out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. The skydiving, she landed pretty badly. Uh, she didn't pick her knees up fast like, You're trying to kill me on my 50th birthday. <laughs> yeah, so she, that, those two didn't go well. We did have a, a shark experience as well. A shark? But, um, like uh, a yeah, great white? What it. was it? It was in Florida to actually get into. They had these sharks you could actually get into a pool with no cage. What? And um, Yeah, and uh, she said no. So <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay then. Um, so there's. So the standing joke is, when have I got it wrong? And she's like, I can count three times you've got it wrong. And I'm like, well, that's in the past. So what did you this, cons- year, this year is going to be good. What did you consider the scariest that someone actually did? Like from Sorry? you, you were actually fearful, like whether it was getting in a shark tank or something, that, that someone actually wanted came to you and they wanted to do it, and you were scared for them that they wanted to do it. Um. You stopped me in my tracks there. I don't know if it's because I'm stupid, <laughs> but I don't actually get scared. Not um, for you, for them, no? Nothing. No, because if I'm scared for them, then they're going to get scared, and therefore <laughs> the fear is going to become alive, you know? Um, but uh, I remember one of the greatest lines ever, and I don't know if you can remember where this came from, but it was called uh, fear causes hesitation and hesitation will cause cause your worst fears to come true. Do you I know don't where know that's what, from? No, I don't. I don't. Point Break. Ah, great yeah. movie. Yeah, it, great movie. But I just remember when he said that line, I was like, 
damn, you're right. The fear is the fear itself. And the more it gets scary, the bigger this animal of fear becomes. So I look at something and I will just try and be cold about it. And I will try again to dismantle it. And I will go, well, okay, what's, what's the worst case scenario? If I walk in there and I get, a, I, I get a smack in the head, you know, or I could get shot. All right, I don't want to be shot, but I don't mind a smack in the head, you know? So I try to weigh it up and I always try to look to my worst downside and then can I like scale it back a little bit from there? And I do that with motorcycle racing. I do that when I'm boxing. I always try to analyze what's the worst thing that can happen here. Yeah. Um, and I look at it and I go, oh, that's not a risk I'm willing to take. So I therefore, det- I don't get to that point where I go, I'm scared. Because when you get scared, you get hopeful. And you're sitting there going, I hope this goes on. I'm not leaving it to chance. Right. I'm not going to do it. If, I, if I'm starting to feel nervous about something, that doesn't happen. Yeah. I'm curious, Steve, what's the hardest thing you pulled off? And what I mean is someone may see, okay, pulling off that the Vatican being mirrored by the Pope is hard. But for you, maybe that wasn't as hard as what it looks like. What on the, on the, the under the surface was harder to pull off than like one of the hardest things that you've actually pulled off? Like behind the scenes. I- yeah, I'd like to maybe say the most challenging. Yeah, most challenging. Um, so when the good thing about it is 20 odd years later, being able to read off the toolbox of achievements that you did earlier, when we go to anyone, we can go forward saying, hey, before you answer my call or speak to me, I'd like to show you my top 20 things I did right. last month. Right. You know, right. and they go, well, OK, what do you need? So I have that credibility to go into every conversation. Right. And the bigger it is. To be honest with you, it's kind of easier it is. I don't want to jinx myself, but if you've got that reputation, that helps you. Mm-hmm. Um, it's when that reputation doesn't come into play. Right. Like, for argument's sake, if you're trying to kind of like handle a, a, um, a, an elephant, the elephant doesn't give a crap who you are. So it's those er- elements where your reputation doesn't help you. I have a client that every year, and I really like this one, I try not to cry on it, um, Every year for his anniversary, and he's been married forever, um, he does something absolutely wonderful for his wife. And the budgets have gone from like $25,000, I think the most was probably about $400,000 for a weekend wow. to do something to celebrate. And it's always big, private jets and taking over diamond mines and just like these palaces in Russia and just, you know, czars. And just, it's, it's big, you know, reenacting an 18th century village. Um, it's always been that kind of stuff. So he contacted me because we were coming up to one of his uh, um, key years, and I think it was the 20th. And he's like, 20th, Steve, you know? And his wife knows me, so she knows it's going to be something. He's like, the 20th, you know, this, this is the 20th, you know? This is big. And I'm like, it is big, it is big. So we've got to make it, <laughs> we've got to make it, you know, big. And so I always talk to the people. You're egging your mind, yeah. I want to get to. I want to get to the root of it. I want to get to the core. So I'm like, yeah, this has got to be big. He's got to be, this has got to be. And I remember him using this word. This has got to be impactful. Hmm. And I went, okay. Taking over the Eiffel Tower is big. Is it impactful? Not when you compare it to some of the other stuff, Hmm. you know? Yeah. So I went, all right, let's have a chat. Talk to me. When did you first meet her? You know, I met her at college. How did you meet her? Oh, God, it didn't go smoothly. Most introductions don't. The girls play hard to get. And uh, I said, so, you know, talk me through it. So we tried talking to her and it hadn't gone very well. And, you know, he was, you know, there was a little bit of a, a break in the armor that he thought he was getting somewhere. So one day he knew which way she went to college and went out for her dinner break. He set up a, a little what they call a car rug, you know, which is those like um, uh, big uh, check um, carpets. And he laid it down and he, um, he got a hamper uh, with sandwiches in it and some, some champagne in there. And he had a boom box that was playing this like romantic music. And as she came out of the college room, he sat on that, that rug, plays the music, offers up a glass of champagne. He said, will you join me? Mm. Now, as a college student, that's pretty cool, isn't it? For sure. Okay? Yeah. He's the head of a company now. So I said to him, why don't we recreate the first moment you met? Mm, that's really awesome. Okay. So 
we thought this is going to be by far the cheapest thing. So where are you? Yes, it's summer, so there should be no rain. Get a rug. Do you remember what the rug was like? He was like, I made me to find a picture, and he found an old picture of when his family was on that rug. So we got a tartan rug that looked the same. Wow. He described the hamper. We got the hamper. Of course, the sandwiches were a little bit better than the sandwiches he'd had then. The champagne was a nice champagne. Had to be in plastic glasses for the reason you're in a public park. Um, but here's where it came challenging, okay? Finding a boom box to run DMC would be proud of <laughs> that actually worked. So we went scouring eBay and all of these audio specialist stores. We went through two that didn't work. Finally found one that was mint condition mm. and worked. And we were so impressed with ourselves when it came with the demo tape <laughs> to show their works. Now here, think about this. This is where it gets silly. We got the rug, we got the hamper, we got the food, we got the drink, we've now got the boom box, okay? How do you record onto that boom box from any of your MP3 players or any of your apples or anything like that? All of the cables, we're looking at this thing going, where do the cables go? So we couldn't actually record onto this system. So that's when I contact that one of the benefits of living in Hollywood. That's when I contacted a, a fellow Look, I Look, there's this like, thing I need. It's called, I think, like an audio cassette tape. Yeah, there. yeah. <laughs> that was the other thing. We, you know, we had to order one online because, again, nowhere sells cassettes. So we ordered it. We had to buy a pack of three or whatever and then send them to him and get him to just put the music on it we liked. But um, And I think the whole thing, the most expensive thing was probably that mint condition boom box. But this all happened for less than a couple of grand. Wow. And that was That's challenging amazing. because there was so much it was there was so much riding on the intricacy and the detail of that that it had to be spot on. Right. Um, and as we all know, and again this is a Dan Sullivan thing, your your mind polishes the past. Um, I didn't want her remembering the rug to be green. We were very fortunate to get that picture. Um, but we had to make it as near as perfect. But that was the most mm. challenging, rewarding, and probably the most impactful. I love that. Thanks for sharing that, Steve. I mean, you really dig deep with these people to figure out deep down what is going to be the best experience for them. It may be things that they're asking. They may ask you for things, but you're going a lot deeper than what they're asking for, it sounds like. At this level, rarely have I ever given anyone what they asked for. Right. The, guy that, the guy that sang Four Tunes live on stage with Journey in yeah. San Diego, his request to me was to meet the guys. Yeah. You know, the guy that wanted, the guy that got the table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David, serenaded by Andrea, wanted an exclusive restaurant. Yeah. So the guy that wanted to get married in the Vatican had no idea we were going to get the Pope involved. Yeah. So I really try to, I want, this will probably go on my tombstone, I want to affect people's smiles. I want someone to wake up at two o'clock in the morning or to be stood there during a cocktail hour and someone says, oh, you know, I'm going over to Italy, do you know? And then go, actually, I've got to tell you a story. And I want, I want them to just be glowing and have the, I want them, my clients, to have the coolest cocktail stories you can get. Right, yeah. I want to encourage people to, if you have a bucket list, if you don't, write down and you know every time i listen to you steve and um i expands my mind i said in the beginning it's a bold statement but i'm sticking by it when you listen to what you talk about and what you help people do it expands their mind of what's possible and even what people thinks possible you're taking it beyond whatever their wildest dreams may be so thank you for this thank you for the book people Thanks. should check out blue fishing the art of making things happen and I just want to wrap things up with what else should people know about the book? I don't know if there's a favorite story or a lesson we didn't talk about. Um, what should they know about the book um, that we haven't talked about yet? Um, I don't want you to get the book if you think it's going to change your life because it isn't. It's going to give you steps that can, but only when you stand up and action them. Yeah. And I want people to realize that this is written by a doorman from East London and therefore you have no excuse to be able to do three times as much as what I've done. So you're out of excuses. Um, each book at the end of each chapter has a very, very simple uh, playbook 
on what you what you need, what the action items are that you can take away and place into anything. So you can read any chapter you like. You don't have to fall all the way through the book in line. Um, you can pick certain chapters, but it's an action book. It's not. It's not like these people that buy a diet yeah. book. Think you don't want I people to passively like, sit back, listen to this, read nah. this, and not do anything. The point nah. of this is to make, I mean, that's the subtitle, The Art of Actually Making Things Happen. Yeah, I'll give you the art, but you have to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Steve, always fantastic. I really appreciate it. Appreciate it, bud. Thank you very much for having me. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.